Doctor Who's iconic lead is an alien from the distant planet Gallifrey, zipping through time and space with a stolen time machine. With an alien character like this, it makes sense for there to be a character who's the complete opposite of our hero. There's one specific character who fits this label, confronting the Doctor time and time again in memorable battles across the universe. This is of course, the Master, first appearing all the way back in Terror of the Autons, a face off against the third Doctor. The Master quickly became a memorable face of Doctor Who and returned in the third series of the Revival show. Russell T Davis is an immense fan of the Master and had every intention of bringing the character back in the Revival show. Although he was determined to keep this a secret by being adamant that he was not interested in bringing him back. In late 2005, empowered with the knowledge that Doctor had been renewed for both a second and third series, Davis began to lay his plans for the Master return in the late 2007 series. With each series, he wanted to bring something massive back. This would follow on the heels of the Daleks in 2005 and the reintroduction of the Cybermen in 2006. For the third series, however, he finally got his chance to do his own adaptation on the most beloved villain of the show, The Master. In today's video, I'll be taking a look at how Russell T Davis perfectly reintroduced The Master. The Russell T Davis era has always conveyed sprinkles to future events such as Bad Wolf, Torchwood and the Series 4 story arcs. However, Davis goes a lot further than that in his third series. So much so, he began seeding references to a man called Mr. Saxon into episodes as early on as 2006, Love of Monsters. Though it was only a newspaper headline, Saxon leads poll 64%, but it just truly shows he has put a lot of time and effort into this story arc. Meanwhile, in Human Nature and the Family of Blood, there isn't any Saxon references in the slightest, but it's a crucial plot point for the three-part finale. It's revealed that Time Lords can also have a genetic structure to become a human. The device is titled a chameleon arc, with the Doctor placing his true identity into a fob watch to hide as a teacher. Therefore, when it's shown again in Utopia, the audience is automatically aware of what's going to happen and has the exact same reaction as Martha does. <laughs> Davis's plan was to reveal that Harold Saxon was in fact the master, his presence undetected by the Doctor because he had become a human via the Chameleon arc. This meant that Davis could initially introduce the Master as a friendly character in order to explore his relationship with the Doctor and the audience would suspect a thing. As for new fans of the show who don't know who the Master was in a classic era, they would have a pretty good idea on who he is, especially the contrast from a nice gentle old man to a psychopath. Jacoby would actually play the Master only briefly, since Davis intended for him to regenerate at the climax of Utopia into the incarnation which would feature in the finale. This would of course be played by John Sims, who's best known for Time Toss Police Detective in Life on Mars and Stephen Edwards from the sitcom Space. For this version of the Master, Davis wanted to draw parallels with David Tennant's portrayal of the Doctor but viewed through the prism of an utter psychopath, which he felt would make the Master a more dangerous to our three friends. Davis gave Yana a companion in form of Champho, whom he would actually murder once he had converted back into the Master, showing the difference from the Doctor being a loving to his companions to a selfish man. As well, John Sims Master does a similar thing with Lucy, a companion type for the Master to physically and mentally abuse her although it was very subtle. In Sound of Drums, Lucy was a great way of building up suspense on what the Master's plan was, as well building an odd relationship with him, someone who we could fully trust and give out his schemes to, instead of the audience watching him talk to himself. However, he orders the top plane to kill Vivian Root, that caused her to be frightened and shaken by Vivian's scream. But later on, when the top plane kills the American president, she shows no sign of fear or alarm and remains calm throughout the entire event. To a point where she joins the master, seemingly enjoying the sight of the top plane flying down and killing one tenth of the human race. <laughs> the 
Yeah, that didn't last very long. Over the year of the martyr's reign, Lucy became cold towards him due to the abuse she receives at his hands. She decided to join by chanting the word Doctor. When the master realises his plan has failed, he tries to escape. However, after she witnessed Francine Jones raise a gun to his direction, and when the doctor stopped her, Lucy herself took the gun and shot him, just like Chanfro did. Davis gave acknowledgement to the Master's previous appearance in Doctor Who, which had ultimately seen the Master having exhausted all his regeneration time. However, the reason of his survival was, he was reincarnated by the Time Lords to fight in the Time War. This additionally adds more to the canon since it was first mentioned in the first series of the revival show. A late addition to the script was the woman's hand pick up the Master's ring while the evil Time Lord laughed at emerges on the screen. Davis had decided to include this shot in order to give future production teams to bring the master back, if they want to of course, since the character was always infamous for coming back from the dead during Kasaku. Since 2007 we've had three reintroductions to the master in three different eras of the show, however I won't be focused on the missing reveal I'm afraid. This will just be a comparison to the newest incarnation of the Master. There's one huge reason why Spyfall fell on its arse and how Utopia was a complete success. Okay, let me come out and say this. Series 12 in general relies on shock factor as a result of hiding its deep flaws. In Spyfall Part 1, the surprise of the Master's return put the fandom into a freezy and saying it was such an awesome episode. And not going to lie, I was exactly the same if you've seen our review back in January. Uh, did you like it? So please tell us, what did you think? Literally, I called Corey about 15 minutes after the episode and he's shocked because I actually found it enjoyable. Because I, I really hate Series 11. I, I like Corey's been listening for Agreed. a whole year. Me, Agreed, me, we know this. So anyways, I thought it was enjoyable. Well, there were moments that I actually looked at the clock because there were moments I could get bored. But yeah, there no, were I, scenes that I, yeah. I really got engaged. I thought, am I dreaming? Is it good? I mean, it has problems like dialogue and Ryan's performance and, and stuff. But yeah. yeah, I thought it was good. Yeah, well. However, I had time to reflect on that specific episode. It really didn't have a long lasting impression on me. But why is that? It proves that you can put one crazy fan service reveal to make you forget a 45 minute uninteresting episode into, into something perfect. I mean, Corey gave it like a 10 out of 10. I'm like, what? There was hardly any build up to this master in this episode. It kind of feels like you blink and you miss it sort of thing. Nonetheless, Utopia works really well, but throughout the story, something was unusual going with Professor Yana. For example, he hear voices in his head, curious familiar to him, such as the Time Vortex, the Time War, Daleks and Regeneration. His face looks so confused but also feel like he recognises it but can't really put his finger onto it. We also find out he uses a fog watch like the Doctor used a few episodes ago in the Human Nature 2 parter We would already know how the fog watch works as it's already been established. This tells us that Professor Yana isn't who he says he is. It makes the audience wonder and question about it. For example, if he's not Professor Yana, then who is he? Another Time Lord, but which one? We get enough information throughout the episode, so when the twist does eventually happen, it's satisfying. Because there was this nerve and feeling that you know something bad's gonna happen, but you didn't know how it was gonna happen. Apart from it was to do with Professor Yana and the Fob Watch. Lastly, what's the Master's plan and motivation in the Sound of Drums slash Last of Time Wars compared to Spyfall Part 2? In the Series 3 finale, John Sim's Master won the election becoming the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. But how? Basically, he hypnotised the world with a network called Archangel, therefore getting into power reporting the world of their first contact with an alien race. He uses the TARDIS as a paradox machine because it allows the top plane to kill their ancestors without any temporal consequences, killing one tenth of the Earth population. With regards to Spyfall Part 2, what was the Master's plan? What do you want? Neil. Oh boy. When you really think about it, the Master's plan in Spyfall Part 2 was basically chasing the Doctor through time and building the framework of the series arc. Making us Whovians ask multiple questions such as Why did he destroy Gallifrey? Or 
who is the timeless children. It's just a bit fruitless to be honest. It's similar to Batman vs Superman, take 5 minutes out of your story to advertise your next film rather than contribute anything to the story. The truth is, there was a really interesting concept around all this that was all swept away in the last 5ish minutes. We even made a video on that specific topic so go check out that after this video finishes. And there we have it ladies and gentlemen, how Dot 2 perfectly reintroduced the master. If it wasn't obvious enough, Utopia is one of my favourite episodes ever, it's in the top 10 for sure. Derek Jacobi and John Sims showed a great performance and great writing behind them. I adore Sasha Dewan's master as many others do, but sadly in my opinion he doesn't really have sensational writing behind him, it's a huge shame. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed my first proper video essay on the channel. If you want to see more like this, please like, comment and subscribe. See guys, it's not that difficult to make a video essay. Gosh, you're so dramatic. Hey, hold up, wait a minute. Did I just hear that right? Yeah, you did. I think we need to do something about this. I'm in. So am I. Oh, crackers.